Hi, I'm Alistair. I'm a games designer. And as it's December, I thought in this video I would make a Christmas themed escape room puzzle tutorial. So I've been starting to decorate my workshop here. Um, you can see I've got a little bit of tinsel, I've got an advent calendar, and I've put some Christmas lights up, but I haven't been able to turn them on yet. And I've also got some Christmas cards here that I'm going to arrange on the shelf behind me. But I'm very particular about the way that I arrange my Christmas cards. So I've got a, a snowman, which I'm going to place here. Uh, and then I've got a sort of a Christmas shop front scene, which I'm going to put next to it. Uh, and then I've got a nice sort of fireplace with the dog on it. And then finally, I've got this beautiful dove. And when I place this final card here, you'll see that uh, my workshop comes alive with the sound of Christmas and my Christmas lights are illuminated. Now, if you're familiar with escape room games, you probably will have come across a puzzle like this before, where you have a set of objects that you need to arrange in a certain order. And for a Christmas themed game, that could be Christmas cards, it could be figures in a nativity scene, it could be Christmas stockings that you have to place on the correct pegs for a number of children. And when you do that, some kind of output is triggered. I made sound and some Christmas lights come on, but it could also be a magnetic lock releasing, which allows players to access a new area of the room, for example. Now, about three years ago on this channel, I made a video tutorial about how to make a puzzle like this. It was one of the first tutorials I made. But in this video, I want to revisit this puzzle idea with a different approach. So this time round, I'm using different hardware. I'm also using different software as well. So let me show you a little bit more detail about how this works. So it will probably come as no surprise to learn that this puzzle is not actually powered by the magic of Christmas, but rather by that very popular technology found in escape rooms, which is RFID. So underneath the shelves on which the cards are going to be placed, I have four PN5180 RFID sensors. Now, these are similar to sensors I've used in uh, previous puzzles, except that these are vicinity sensors rather than proximity sensors. This means that they have a greater range, and it means that rather than having to be carefully lined up on top of them flat, the card, which is uh, containing an RFID tag on the back there, can actually be stood at quite a range, so, you know, a distance of around uh, 20 to 30 centimeters and it doesn't actually have to be lined flat to the sensor either I'm standing them at 90 degrees and they're still being detected perfectly well the readers themselves use an SPI interface which is going through this ribbon cable here and that's going to an RJ45 connector here and into an Ethernet cable now again in my Previous project, I used these kind of cables and I think it confused people a little bit. I didn't explain it very well. So these uh, readers here do not have any kind of Ethernet connection. However, I am using a standard Cat5 Ethernet cable just to carry the signal lines down onto the shelf at the bottom and hidden amongst my nativity scene. You'll find that I'm using an ESP32 and I have my four RJ45 patch cables, which are going to the four sensors above. So these are not actually carrying any kind of ethernet signal. I'm just using them as a convenient way of passing eight separate signal lines from a centralized board here up to each of the sensors. Um, and then we've also got an output here which is going to a, a relay, which is what's triggering the lights as well. Um, now, the reason for using an ESP32 rather than an Arduino in this case is that um, the sensor boards themselves run at 3.3 volt logic. So when you have an SPI interface, we've got a number of uh, connections that have to go here. We have got a master out slave in line, that's a MOSI line, which is carrying data from the controller to the sensor. We've also got a master in slave out or a MISO that's carrying data back from the sensor to the processor. 
and we've got a clock line that goes between them. We've also got a reset line and a slave select line and all of these are running at 3.3 volts. Most Arduinos, like an Arduino Uno or Nano, run at 5 volts. So if you wanted to connect these sensors to an Arduino, you'd have to run them through a logic level converter. But an ESP32, which is something which, again, I've increasingly used in my more recent projects, it's a newer chip, uh, it's faster, it's more capable, and it has features such as Wi-Fi, um, Bluetooth already on board, things like that. But one of the crucial differences is it runs at 3.3 volt logic rather than 5 volt logic, and that means you don't need to worry about that kind of logic level conversion. You can take the signal lines directly out from the sensor board, run them through these uh, Ethernet cables that I'm using here, and then these are wired through this uh, on this board here directly to the pins of the ESP. So now that you've had that look behind the scenes, I'm going to demonstrate the puzzle again, except this time I'm going to turn on the serial monitor so you can see the output generated by the ESP32 as we go. So now if I take one of the cards and I place it on the shelf, what you'll see in the output window there is an array of four values representing the objects that can be detected by the four readers. Now obviously only this reader at the moment has anything that it can detect. So what we're displaying there is the unique ID of the card that's been placed in front of that sensor. And this array is updated every time a new object is placed or every time it is removed as well. So if I place this dove in a different position now instead, we'll place that in front of that sensor instead, and you can see the array has been updated. Now let me place uh, another card here. So I think the, uh, the snowman goes at the top. You can see our array has now got two elements in it. And if they're correct, we've also got a little uh, appended onto the end of the ID tag there. We are saying that they're in the correct place. Now, the way I've got the puzzle designed at the moment, that feedback is not provided to the players. I'm just using this to uh, debug the puzzle. I'm assuming the players will be given some information like a riddle or something that tells them the correct order in which objects are placed. But you could actually have some kind of visual feedback as well, like a, a light that turns red or green that tells you when each object is correct. That would make the puzzle rather simple there. Um, so if we now place this item here, I'm just going to stand up straight, and you can see that we now have three items in the correct place. And when I place the final one, which was the, uh, the shop scene up here, what will happen now is that the puzzle will become solved. This will trigger a relay which activates the lights. And in this version of the puzzle controller, this is now uh, what we call a latched state. So uh, if I were to now move any of the cards off again, the lights remain on even though um, th these readers are no longer correcting the detect tags anymore because once the puzzle has been solved, we're actually getting it to remain in this state. To reset the puzzle, I have one more ID tag here. So this is not used to solve the puzzle, but rather this is when uh, the puzzle is in a solve state like this, if any of the readers detect this card instead, what happens there is that the puzzle becomes reset, the lights go off and it is ready to go again. Okay, so let's take a look at the hardware in a bit more detail. Here's the PN5180 RFID readers I'm using. You can see the chip here and a bunch of other components. And at this end of the board, we've got the aerial, which is going to be where we place an object containing a tag to be detected. And we've got the row of pins. There's quite a few, 13 in total, um, because this board has got a relatively sophisticated interface. Now, in previous projects, you'll have seen me use one of these boards instead. This is an RC522, which is very popular in Arduino projects. You'll see it's a bit simpler. It's got fewer components, fewer pins, and physically, it's slightly smaller size as well. But the key difference is, whereas the RC522 board uses a protocol called ISO14443, which is for proximity sensors, 
The PN5182 uses the ISO 15693 protocol, which is for vicinity sensors, and that means it has a greater detection range of tags. In other respects, they're quite similar. So, in terms of the tags that they can detect, you can get key fobs, like this blue one here. You can also get ID cards, as I was using in the uh, demonstration here. You can get RFID stickers. So if I peel one of these off, you'll be able to see the aerial on the other side. And you can even get tiny capsules like these, which have got RFID circuitry inside them. Now, the important thing is not only do tags come in different physical packages like these, but they're also designed to work with a particular one of these protocols. So all of these are passive tags, they all operate on the same frequency, but a ID card designed to work with the ISO 1443 reader won't work with the ISO 15693 reader, for example. So that's the first thing. Now let me talk a bit more about that interface to the board. So if I hold this up to the camera, you can see we've got that row of header pins again. On the left hand side, we've got two power lines. We've got plus five volts and plus 3.3 volts, and then a reset pin. And then we've got pins labelled NSS, MOSI, MISO and SCK. And that tells us that this board is using a serial peripheral interface, or SPI. And that's an industry standard interface used to communicate between various devices. And the way in which data is sent over SPI is by a series of high and low pulses on those pins. But SPI doesn't actually define what a high voltage is. So on this board, it's 3.3 volts. But as we know, a regular Arduino runs at 5 volts. Now, it's still possible to connect this sensor to an Arduino, but it just takes a little bit more work. So here you can see I've got a cable harness plugged into the header pins. I'm not using the four pins on the right hand side. But the wires that are carrying data to the sensor, instead of going straight into the Arduino, are plugged into the breadboard here on the low side of a logic level converter. That's why the L pins are for low. The H pins on the other side are connected to the 5 volt outputs coming from these GPIO pins. Now, I've also got this blue and purple wires here between the Arduino and the sensor, and those are connected directly to the MISO and the busy lines. Now, the point about these wires is that they're carrying data at 3.3 volts from the sensor back to the Arduino. And even though the Arduino runs at 5 volts, you don't need an input signal to be exactly 5 volts to be registered as high. Anything about 2.7 volts or higher will be sufficient. So we don't need to step up the voltage returned from the sensor to the Arduino. We just need to step down the voltage of anything sent from the Arduino to the sensor. And that's what this logic level converter is for. OK, so we can use a 5 volt device, but you can see that it makes the wiring a lot more complicated. And for four sensors, we'd have to replicate this approach four times. So to make that easier, that's why I chose to use an ESP32 for this project instead. Now, there's several different boards based around the ESP32 chip. I'm using this one, which is a Node MCU. And as you can see, I've got it wired directly to the pins of the PN5180 now. Because the whole system is at 3.3 volts, there's no need for any additional conversion to take place. And this makes the wiring much easier. But you can still see that there's quite a lot of cabling required. And if we were to run this many individual cables from the controller to all four of the sensors used in this project, we'd quite quickly end up with quite a rat's nest of jumbled wires. So to solve that problem, I used another piece of hardware. So this little device is called an RJ45 breakout board. And you can see we've got an ethernet port here, so a standard ethernet connector. And then we've got a row of eight header pins, which are standard 2.54 millimeter pins. So that means that they will slot into a breadboard like this. And from here, we can plug an ethernet cable into the port side and access the pins on a component on the breadboard here, or we could wire them out to some screw terminals here, for example. 
So uh, now, just to demonstrate, if I take an Ethernet cable here and I plug it into the port, like so, and then what I can do is have my controller plugged in at that end of the cable, and at the other end of the cable I have my sensor, which is plugged into another one of these breakout boards, and I'll plug the Ethernet cord in there. So what I've got now is a really convenient way to send data over an arbitrary length cable. So to be clear, I'm not actually using the Ethernet protocol at all. I'm just sending the SPI protocol over these stranded pairs of wires that are contained within a patch cable. Now, rather than keep the components on a breadboard, I moved them onto a strip board like this. Now, if you've not used a strip board before, it's some way similar to working with a breadboard, but it's slightly more robust. So it still has a selection of holes like this, which are a standard spacing apart, so you can just plug components into them. And on the reverse of the board, you'll see that there are copper tracks. So these will conduct uh, electricity between and connect components in the same row as each other. If you don't want a pair of components in the same row to be connected, you can drill out the copper tracks using a Dremel or similar tool. And that's what I've done here. So uh, here I've soldered the legs of the components on this side of the board together to make a connection. So what I've got on the, the right hand side here, I've soldered in a, a set of header pins, which I'm going to plug my ESP32 into. And then you can see I've got uh, wires at the top there going to each of these four sets of header pins here. They are going to be for my RJ45 breakouts. And those wires will carry the slave select, the reset and the busy lines. The SPI interface is going to be carried and shared between them all on the copper tracks on the board. Then I've got these blue pins at the bottom here. These are going to be for the relay connection. So this is actually a, a pretty robust board. It's not as pretty looking as a PCB, I'll grant you, but actually it's just as electronically reliable because the width of the copper tracks on the back here is actually probably bigger than you'd normally get on the traces on a PCB board. So it's electronically pretty good. And it's certainly more robust than a breadboard. It's perfectly good for use in a production environment. So now having shown you the hardware in the flesh, as it were, in terms of actually understanding how everything is wired together, I think it's easier to refer to a diagram such as this one. Now, on the face of it, this might look pretty scary and complicated, but when you actually begin to break it down, it's not as bad as it looks. So that's what we're going to do. Starting at the top of the screen here, I've got my array of four readers. Here in the centre, we've got the ESP32. And then at the bottom here, I've got a 5 volt relay. Those two are also connected to a 5 volt DC barrel jack here. And then on this side of the relay, we've got our load that's going to be triggered. So I've got my row of Christmas lights. And I've also got uh, this module here. Now, I forgot to demonstrate this in the video. This is an MP3 player module. And in previous projects, I've used something called a, a DF player which is a module that you can trigger different sound effects from code running on an Arduino. This particular player though, as soon as it receives power, it will start playing any songs that are saved in MP3 or WAV file format on the inserted SD card. So it's a really useful little board to use if what you want to do is get some immediate sound effect feedback that's triggered by a relay, as we're doing in this case. OK, so looking at the board wiring in a bit more detail. Now, I'm not showing the RJ45 Ethernet connectors here because I want to really highlight uh, which pins are connected to which. But bear in mind that in real life, rather than having these wires connected directly here, what I was doing is running them through those uh, Cat5 patch cables. OK. So on the uh, left-hand side of each board, those pins, the first pin on the left-hand side is plus 5 volts. And you'll see that's connected to a red wire. And all of the 5-volt connectors on all of the boards are wired together. And they are uh, wired through this red wire here into the V-in socket of the ESP32. And that, in turn, is connected to a 5-volt DC barrel jack here. So um, this is one thing to note, even though 
These sensors use 3.3 volt logic. The ESP32 runs at 3.3 volts as well, but you can actually power it with a 5 volt power supply going into the VE pin. And in fact, the sensors need to have a 5 volt power supply to actually uh, power up and operate them as well. They also have a 3.3 volt power supply, and that is the one that's going into this orange wire here. Again, these are all connected together, so they share a 3.3 volt connection between all of the sensor boards, and that is going to the 3.3 volt pin on this side of the ESP. They've also got a ground line, which is connected all between them, which is this black line here, and that goes to the ground line on the ESP. So those are all uh, the power connections that are used and when I was using my strip board earlier those were some of the lines that were going up those copper tracks and they were shared between all of the boards because they all receive the same power. Okay now we know that we're using an SPI interface so now let's look at that and uh, just like any other bus interface SPI also has some shared lines that go between them so they are the uh, MOSI line, the MISO line and the system clock line and they are these green, blue and yellow wires here so again these are connected to the same pins on all of the sensors and then they are connected to the pins on the ESP which are um, kind of dedicated to that function. So here you can see I've got a pin that's labelled VSPI MOSI that's connected to MOSI which is the green one here we've got another pin which is the uh, MISO pin and that's connected to the blue line and here we've got system clock. Now here is something I need to point out though. One of the difficulties perhaps of migrating to the ESP32 chip is the fact that there is a lot more variation in terms of the uh, dev boards that are available. So when we talk about ESP32 that is the chip itself and the chip itself is I think a 40 pin chip but most of the boards that you buy that it is mounted on so when you get the, the physical hardware that's also got things like the USB connector and um, you know the, the aerial for the Wi-Fi and everything else mounted on it they come in very many different varieties and crucially the order of the pins and even the number of pins differs between boards so um, I wanted to point this out just so you're, you're very careful where you've seen physically you see I've plugged in 3.3 uh, volts here to this uh, the pin that's highest up the left hand side and my V in pin is the one lowest down the left hand side they may be in different places uh, on your ESP32 board and likewise on this side I'm using the pins that are um, reserved for the SPI interface so the MOSI, the MISO and the system clock here but on a different ESP32 board they might be in a different place um, so if you're using the exact same board as me this is something based on the node MCU 32s layout you can uh, copy the exact wiring that I've used here and that will be absolutely fine but if you're using a different ESP32 board so some of them have um, 36 pins some of them have 30 pins uh, some of them have a different layout completely and come with onboard um, LCD displays and things like that do check the a particular pinout arrangement for the ESP32 board you're using. Don't just assume they're going to be laid out in the same uh, order as I've got here. That is one of the nice things about working with uh, Arduino based boards is that um, although you can get you know different clones of Arduino Nanos and Megas and Unos and things like that, they generally speaking all follow the same uh, physical format and pinout. That sadly is not true with ESP32 boards. Okay, so we've got uh, these three SPI wires here that go to the three uh, SPI lines here and they go to the shared SPI pins wherever they may be on your ESP32 board. Those are all the uh, shared lines that are going between the sensors but every sensor also has three unique uh, Interfa uh, interface lines that are going to it. So they are this brown line here which is going to reset, the white line which is the slave select pin and the grey line which is busy and you'll see so each of these boards has its own brown, white and grey, brown, white and grey line and brown, white and grey going to those uh, three pins there. 
So, I mean, they do pretty much what they say on the tin. So the signal here will be uh, activated when the when the ESP wants to reset the sensor. So this is a, an input to there. The slave select line, that's so that the ESP32 can uh, choose which one of the sensors is allowed to communicate on the SPI bus at a time. And the busy line, well, this uh, actually is sent from the sensor to the ESP32 to let it know when it is um, currently in the process of reading a tag. So there are three unique pins, and you can see that I've got for my leftmost sensor on the top here, for this particular example, I'm using this pin here, which is GPO 22. Uh, then I've got these slave selectors going into GPO 21, which confusingly is not next to it on the board. There's a gap of two between it. And then I've got my grey line going into GPIO 5, even more confusingly. Then the next sensor, I'm using pins GPIO 17, 16 and 4. And then I'm going to GPIO 0, 2 and 15. And then this one here, um, I'm actually using some pins on the reverse side of the board here. So here I'm using a busy pin of 32 then 33 and 25 and you'll see those values when I show you the code listing later you'll see those values appear in the code listing. So um, it is a little bit uh, tricky if you're used to Arduino that there is some more complexity involved in wiring an ESP32. You may wonder for example why I haven't used uh, these three pins on the top of the board for the three unique lines going to this sensor. Well um, the reason for that is if you a hover over that, you'll see it says GPIO 8, but also flash D1. Here we've got GPIO 7, flash D0, and GPIO 6. So although these have been assigned uh, pin numbers of 6, 7, and 8, these pins are already being used by the ESP32 to address the onboard flash memory. So they're not actually useful as output pins um, for your projects. That's the reason why I've used uh, these other pins on the reverse side of the board as well of uh, 32, 33 and 25. So you do just need to be a little bit uh, a little bit worried. I'll include in the description I'll include uh, a link to some very good references for uh, the numbering and the functions of all the different pins in various ESP32 boards which uh, you might want to refer to as well. Okay, so that's all the um, the reader side. Then when we look at the relay, so I've used relays in lots of projects before, and they're pretty straightforward. This is a five volt relay. So we've got power supplied from a positive five volt input and ground, and that is the same power supply that we're also using to supply the ESP32 and the boards. And then we also have this signal wire, uh, the yellow wire here, which I've got going to keep open 26. Now, when that is high, the relay on this side is going to be open. So that means that there is no closed circuit on uh, this side of the relay and no current flows. When we write a low signal to this uh, wire here, what's going to happen is internally a little metallic contact is going to flip across and make a connection here uh, between these two wires, so between the normally open and the common pin. And that means that uh, power from this connector here can flow through this circuit. That's going to cause the lights to light up and also the MP3 player to play the melody. Now I'm using, uh, as it happens, a 5 volt supply on this side as well, just as I was using a 5 volt supply on this side of the relay, but that's not actually necessary. This could be a 12 volt power supply or a 24 volt power supply. Whatever is needed to drive the load on this side of the relay when the puzzle is solved um, because this circuit here is completely isolated from the one on this side of the relay. Um, okay, and that is it for the wiring. And now let's take a look at the code that is running on the ESP32. So even though, strictly speaking, this is not an Arduino chip, um, notice that I'm actually still using the Arduino IDE to write and also to upload the code onto the board and you can still use familiar tools like the serial monitor as well. Um, the only thing you need to do is to make sure you go to the boards manager package in the Arduino uh, IDE and download the definitions of the ESP32 boards 
and then in your target device here you simply select the appropriate kind of ESP32 that you're using. So as I mentioned mine is the Node MCU board. Um, you can obviously use uh, different development environments as well, maybe some of you using VS Code or something like that, that's fine. But if you are currently using Arduino and you're thinking of migrating to ESP, um, know that that is uh, you can still keep your familiar software installed. Um, you can still reuse much of the same code and libraries as well. So that is something that makes the transition uh, a little bit easier, just to know. So I'm going to carry on using the Arduino IDE because I think it's something that a lot of people will be familiar with. And then we start our code with uh, the section where we include any external libraries. So um, I'm using a library which you can download from here. I'll also include that in the in the downloads and the link. And uh, this actually comes in two parts. It's actually the same library, but the first one is the general set of functions required to access the PN5180. And then we have a, a specific subset of those functions that relate to reading the ISO 15693 tags. The uh, board itself, the sense board, is actually capable. It's a dual uh, purpose board. It is capable of reading the ISO 14443 tags as well. Um, just like the RC522 boards do. But that doesn't really add any value in this project. The whole reason for us wanting to use this board is to take advantage of the um, enhanced range that you get from this protocol instead. So I'm not going to bother importing uh, the old style proximity library as well. Uh, then we go on to the constants. So these are values that are not going to change throughout the duration of the code. Uh, first of all, we define how many readers we're going to have. We're going to use uh, four readers here. Now, uh, in theory, you can scale this project. You can have as you know, you can just have one reader if you want, or you can have uh, more readers. The SPI interface will handle um, you know lots more devices than we got connected here. But there's two reasons why I've limited it to four. Really, um, the first is from uh, really a hardware limitation point of view. Remember that every additional sensor that we add, we have to, we can share the SPI interface that already exists, that's fine, but we do have to use three more GPIO pins for that reset, slave select and busy line for each sensor. And what you'll find is um, even with the additional pins that you get on the SP32, you'll run out of pins quite quickly. There are ways around that, of course. You can buy uh, port extenders and things like that, but it makes the wiring more complicated again. Um, and the other reason is from a, a gameplay point of view, really. Um, ultimately, what we're creating here is, is a puzzle game to be used in something like an escape room. And if you ask players to rearrange uh, you know, significantly more items than that, if you're asking them to arrange eight items uh, in the correct order, for example, there's just too many combinations. It's not actually a very fun puzzle to do. Likewise, if you have too few uh, objects to, to rearrange, then they can kind of brute force it too easily. So I find kind of four is the, the sweet spot in the middle, but you can, if you want, vary that uh, you know, up or down as you see fit. Uh, then what we do is we define an array of byte values which are going to be the correct uh, tag IDs which we want to detect in front of each one of the sensors. So this is the correct tag ID that we want the first sensor to read and then the tag that the second sensor should read, the third and the fourth etc. And you'll see I've just written comments there to remind me as much as anything else uh, what the cards were that were associated with those tags. Now the first time you run this code you probably don't know the ID associated with each of your uh, NFC tags. They're not normally written on the tags themselves but uh, when you run this code if you recall from the demonstration where I had the serial monitor running what you'll actually see output in the serial monitor is the ID of any tag that's detected anyway. So what you can do is you can kind of run this script the first time, hold up all the tags that you want to use in front of each sensor, and from the serial monitor copy and then paste back here into the code uh, those values that you that you want to um, store. They are all eight byte values, and you can see I've actually separated out each of the uh, the individual byte values here. Um, and notice that they all end uh, the same way actually. They all end with uh, a single byte 
and then 4 and then E0 and that's kind of like a signature for the ISO 15693 standard so you'll find that all of your uh, tags will probably end with that same pattern anyway. Uh, likewise we also need to uh, record the ID of the tag that we want to scan and reset the puzzle so we do that the same way again you simply hold it up in front of any of the sensors while the puzzle is working take a note from the serial monitor and copy it into uh, this value here and that will be the ID if um, when that is read and the puzzle is solved is going to reset the puzzle uh, we also have uh, one more idea right here so this is um, this is just an array of eight bytes that are all zero um, and what that is that is going to be the case when one of the readers cannot detect a, ta uh, a tag at all so if you know there's nothing in front of it that we're going to compare the value read to this uh, set of zeros here to say well that's the case and there's no item present at all basically uh, so that's that's the uh, sort of like a dummy tag that we've created to be associated with the case when there is no object at all uh, and we also specify the uh, the GPIO pin that we have plugged the relay into um, so you can refer to the wiring diagram to see how we got that number 26 there and then we move on to the global section so these are variables which are um, shared between several functions in the code and the first thing we do is we define an array of um, objects that represent each of the four readers we're going to use so every reader is represented by an object that is one of these PN5180 ISO 15693 objects very handy name and we create it passing in three um, values that represent the pins of the slave select the busy and the reset lines that it is connected to on the ESP32 so um, again from the wiring diagram if you have used different available pins you'll just want to update these values here to reflect the pins that you've used uh, the numbers you see here relate to the pins I was using in the wiring diagram I just showed um, so uh, yeah if you these are the ones on the left hand side of the board the other three were on the right hand side of the board um, and we also create an array here so this is an array that has eight bytes for each of the number of readers that we have and we're going to use this to keep track basically of what the last known tag was that was uh, registered by each of these four sensors so we're basically going to just keep a tally and we're going to when a new tag is detected we're going to compare it to the value that we already knew about in this array here to decide whether an object has been added or removed or it's been changed and this is also what we are going to compare to our intended solution state which we had up here and when the last known ID detected by each of the readers was equal to the correct ID that we wanted to be detected that's when we know the puzzle is solved okay so then we go on to the setup function so setup is the function that is called when the code uh, first starts running when um, when the ESP receives power uh, and the first thing we do is we configure the relay pin as an output and we write a high signal to it so again as, as mentioned before I'm using what's called an active low relay um, they're the most common types of relay certainly which I have found to be available but they're a little bit perhaps counterintuitive from what you you may think so a relay normally uh, in its default state has the normally closed and the common terminal connected and in the case of an active low relay that is when the uh, trigger signal is high when you want the relay to change state and you want the common pin to be connected to the normally open pin instead what you do is you write a low signal to the 
relay pin. Now, like I say, that, that might seem the opposite. Normally we think of the default state of something being low and then we uh, change it by changing it to high, but active low relays are the other way around. It doesn't really matter if you've got another sort of relay, you simply swap this for a low and then later on when we want to activate it, we swap it for a high there instead. Um, so you just need to do that to match your, your relay style. Um, we'll start a serial connection, that's what we're going to use to uh, monitor the outputs in the serial IDE uh, monitor window and we'll also output um, the name of this file and the date at which the code was last compiled as well. Um, this is something I've been adding to all my recent projects uh, I can't remember it was a, a tip that someone gave me but it's really handy because what it means is if you ever find uh, an Arduino or an ESP32 or any other board lying around somewhere and you can't quite remember what code it was running, what you can do is you can plug it in uh, to a USB connector, fire up your Arduino serial monitor and the first thing that will be output is the name of the script that it is running and the date uh, at which that script was uploaded to the board as well. So um, if, you're, if you, like me, are a sort of a bit disorganised and untidy and you, you have lots of half-finished projects lying around the place, uh, that's actually a really useful thing to include at the top of all your code, uh, just to let you know uh, what, it's, what it's expected to be doing, at least. Um, and then we need to actually initialise all of our uh, four readers. And there's a couple of steps involved in initializing them. We're, we're going to call a couple of functions in turn, all of which are provided uh, by that PN5180 library that we included at the top. And we're going to call them on each of the readers in turn. So what we'll do is we'll create a loop and we'll loop uh, our uh, counter i starting at zero, going up to the number of readers and we'll increase by one each time. And we'll just output something to the serial monitor to say we're initializing it. So first of all, we call the begin function on the ith reader in the NFC array. So remember, NFC was our uh, array of variables here. So we're calling it NFC because of near field communication, but it's just a, a short variable name to refer to the readers, that's all. So when i is zero on the first time through this loop, this is the zeroth element of the array. So we're going to start off on the reader that's connected to pins 21, 5 and 22. What are we going to do with that reader? Well, first of all, we're going to call the begin function. And then we're going to call the reset function. And then we're going to call the setup RF function. That's actually what's going to be uh, initializing the RF field, which is what's going to detect the presence of a tag or not. And then we loop through it again. And on the next time through the loop, i is going to be equal to 1. So this is the, uh, the I was going to say the first element of the array. It looks like it's the second element, but remember that uh, we use zero-based indexing. So this is when i equals 1. We're looking at this sensor. And again, we're going to call begin, then reset, then set up RF. And then we work our way through. So we go begin, reset, set up RF, and begin, set, uh, reset, set up RF. And once we've done all of that, all of our readers have had those three functions called on them. Uh, we can just print a little message saying that setup is complete and we are ready to go into the main program loop, which we have here. So this runs over and over again while the, uh, while the ESP is turned on. And once again, we loop through each of the readers. You'll find that this is a kind of a pattern that we're using a lot in this code, um, is just to loop over all of the readers in turn. And the first thing we do, we're going to define a new 8-byte variable. We'll call it this UID. And uh, it's called that because this is the uh, unique identifier that is being read this time round, basically. It's what can this reader read right now? And to find that out, we're going to call a function called getInventory. Uh, that sounds like a slightly peculiar naming convention, maybe. That is, uh, the, that is the terminology that is used uh, in the language of ISO 15693 to get the ID tag of, of a, a card, basically, to get the unique ID. So we're going to call getInventory, and we're going to use it to populate the value this ID, uh, this UID, sorry, that we just created. And we're uh, going to test whether we're successful or doing that or not 
by setting this variable RC. Okay, so this line here is a little bit complicated, but we're going to go to the reader that we're talking about in the current time through the loop. So the first time around, we're going to be looking at the first reader. We're going to call the get inventory function. That's going to try to uh, retrieve the ID of a tag in front of it. If it can retrieve one successfully, it's going to write it to the this UID variable that we put up here. And then the RC value here will let us know whether it was successful or not in doing that. Okay. Now, if it was successful, then RC will uh, be equal to this uh, variable here. So it says OK at the end. That means it was successfully able to read it. There are some other status codes as well, but I'm only looking for the OK one because we just want to know that, yes, we were able to detect a tag and I read it. Uh, in that case, what we need to do is we need to look at uh, more detail about what the tag that was read was. And to do that, we're going to use a function called memcomp. Uh, so this is a, a little bit confusing. What we're going to compare is we're going to compare what the tag that has just been read was. That's this UID. We're going to compare that to the last known tag that we read for this reader. And because there are eight bytes in a tag, we're going to compare eight bytes of memory between these two variables. And we're going to see whether the result of that comparison is zero. So memcomp, the best way to, th to, to think about memcomp, I find, is, is it's a function that lets you know if there are any differences between two uh, variables in memory. Okay, So we're comparing the tag that's just been read by this sensor to the last tag that was read by this sensor. We're comparing eight bytes of those uh, variables. And if there were no differences between them, which is the same as saying if it's equal to zero, well, in that case, uh, there's nothing more to do. That uh, that meant that you know the, the, the card has been placed in front of it and it's still got exactly the same card in front of it. So what we can do is we can continue and we'll go on to the next reader instead. Now, if that's not the case, that means that we're now detecting something different than we were before. Either we weren't detecting a, a tag at all before and now we are, or maybe on the last time through the loop there was a different object there than the one we've detected this time. So then we fall into this section here. So what we do now, instead of memcomp, we're now calling memcopy. So what this does is this copies whatever the current tag value was into the array where we keep track of the last UID. And again, it's still an 8-byte value. So what this is saying is this is like, OK, well, we know that we've now got a new uh, value read by this sensor. So let's update the array so it's up to date with whatever the, the current state of all the sensors is. And having done that, what we're going to do is we're going to call two other functions. First of all, we're going to call this one. This is the one that actually displays the values on the serial monitor so we can see what the, uh, the state of all the IDs read by the sensors are. And then having done that, well, we better check actually if the puzzle has been solved or not. Uh, are all the values that are being read the correct values for each of the sensors? OK, so that's what we do there. I'll, I'll show you the, the detail contained in those two functions in a second. I'll just talk through the logic first of all. OK, then we've got another else function here. So this else is corresponding to this line here. So all of this section here, this only gets executed uh, when the sensor is able to correctly detect a tag. That's because we know that the result code was equal to the OK status here. Now, if the sensor can't uh, read a tag, it returns something other than the OK status code, and we end up in this section here. So what this means now is that for some reason or other, um, the sensor has been unable to detect an object in front of it. So uh, commonly it's been removed. So what we need to know is, is that a change in state compared to the last frame? Remember I said right at the top of the code that um, all valid uh, ISO 15693 IDs end in E0. That's the most significant byte. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the last known ID that was 
reported by this sensor, we're going to look at the seventh uh, element of that 8-byte array. So remember, zero base is actually the last element. And we're going to say, well, if the last known value had an E0 at the end of it, that means that previously this sensor was able to detect a valid tag. But now we know it's not able to detect a valid tag. So something must have been uh, removed. An object that previously was there is no longer there. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, call memset. This is our third mem function here. We had mem compare, mem copy. Now we've got mem set, and we're going to set the value of the last known ID for this sensor to uh, eight zeros. Basically, it's going to be a bunch of, of uh, a zero eight byte value, which you'll remember uh, was the same as what we defined up here for our no ID value. Okay. So, uh, let me just get back to the right place. That was here again. And having done that, what we need to do is uh, now we'll once again get the serial monitor to display an updated uh, state of what all the puzzle sensors are. We don't need to call uh, check if puzzles solved again here because remember that this section of code here was called because something has been removed that was previously present. So we know that the puzzle can't be solved because at least one of the sensors is not actually detecting any object in front of it at all. We only need to call that function um, after one of the sensors has detected a new or a changed object instead. Okay, then we have uh, a slight delay just to, to pause the code a little or to slow down the code a little bit so we're not trying to run it at a million speeds a second, which we really don't need to do. And then we just keep looping through that whole section again for each of the readers in turn and we continue doing that over and over. Okay, so what we need to do is to look in a little bit more detail about those functions that we called here. We've got the show current status and the check if puzzle solved. So let's have a look at those now. And the first one here, we've got show current status. So this really is just purely for debugging purposes and for configuring the puzzle to start with. All this is about is displaying uh, the state of the IDs that can be read by each sensor to the serial monitor window. So it's all about just formatting that really. So once again, we loop through all the sensors. We've done that lots of times in this code now. We print the ID of the sensor we're looking at. And then what we do is we'll compare again. So memcomp is the compare function. We'll compare the last uh, or the value in the array of last known IDs for this sensor. We'll compare that to that constant value we just find at the top of no ID. So remember that was a, a bunch of eight zeros in a row. And if memcomp returns zero there, what that means is that the last known ID of this sensor was a whole load of zeros. And this is what we set up here when nothing could have been detected. So we know that this sensor can't detect any object and we'll simply print, I've printed three lines in a row here. I mean, you could just print a blank if you wanted, you print zero. Whatever you want to do to visually indicate the fact that that reader is online and we've reported a result from it, but that result is all zeros because it hasn't been able to read a tag. If that's not the case, then it means that we've got uh, a different value in the last ID array, so something that's not zero. So then what we're going to do is we're going to print it out. So uh, we are already in a loop here. This loop is looping the value from i to the number of readers. Now we're going to set up another loop, and this is going to loop a variable called j between 0 and 8. So this is actually going to loop over each byte in the 8-byte ID that has been detected by the ith uh, reader. Or, or rather, it's going to be the, the value that was stored in the last ID array stored by the ith reader. Okay, so we're going to uh, look up that reader's value in the array. We're going to get the jth element of the 8-byte array. And then uh, the, the line here, so this is purely for formatting purposes, okay? This is nothing to do with actually functional code here. But um, 
you'll notice at the top here, when I wrote these uh, codes at the top here, you'll see that some of these are bytes with uh, single character places. So I've got uh, a 1 or a 4 there, and some of them are E0. So basically, if you are a byte value that just has the value 1, what I want to do is to insert some padding so that that is still displayed as a, a 2 character hexadecimal um, value. So I want that to be a 0x01, for example. And the sole reason for doing that is that when you're reading it in uh, the serial monitor, these are all going to be 8-byte values, and I want them to all occupy a fixed length on the screen because I just find it much easier to read like that. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm looking at the byte value of the jth byte in the UID array corresponding to the ith reader and if that is a single character hex value so if it's less than 0x10 there I'm going to print a leading zero so all this is doing is just putting some padding at the beginning of the printed out number uh, just to make it align and to ensure that every 8 byte ID actually occupies a, a fixed length that's all we're doing here so it's purely kind of uh, you know formatting niceties we're looking at here then we got to print out actually what the byte value it was and then if the uh, if the value in the array that was read is equal to the correct ID um, again we're only comparing eight characters then we'll just append that little visual display on the end that says uh, correct on the end there now if you wanted to provide some visual feedback to the players as well so I gave the example maybe you want to have an LED that lighted up um, green in front of each slot that had the correct item in, placed in front of it or something like that this is the section of the code where you'd add that so whatever is placed in this section here is only going to be executed uh, for the ith reader if that reader is uh, has got the correct object placed in front of it. So if you had a row of, of uh, LEDs and you wanted to light the ith element from that LED strip, for example, um, this is where you would place that code. Uh, then we'll just put uh, a new line and we'll just put some dashes at the end. Uh, so there we go. So that's the function that actually displays the state of the screen and this is what you saw in the demonstration video earlier. Um, we then called the check if puzzle solved method and we called this every time a sensor detected a tag that was different from the one that it detected in the last frame. So um, what we need to do here is to check whether all of the sensors are um, detecting the correct tag. So once again, and you've seen this many times now, we're going to loop over all the readers. We're going to call memcomp again, which is a function you've seen lots of times as well now. Uh, and uh, you know, in the last example here, we were comparing memcomp to the correct UID in order to print correct onto the screen. Here we're going to do almost exactly the same, but with a very slight difference at the end. This time we're going to compare the last known value detected by the sensor to the correct UID. And if it is different from zero, we are going to return and uh, break out of this function. So when you're dealing with um, loops like this, you'll see a couple of different command structures. A little bit earlier on, uh, I called the continue function up here. So if you're in a loop here and you get to a point where you want to not carry on any more processing um, of the current iteration through the loop, you can call continue and what it will do is it will jump back up to the top of the loop and continue on to the next element as well. Uh, you might also have seen a break command used in a loop sometimes. So when you have a break, what it means is it stops execution of the loop completely and it carries on to the next line. Now here, what I want to do is if any of the readers are not the same as their correct ID. I don't want to continue because that will just go on and check the next reader and I don't need to check the next reader because as soon as one of them hasn't detected the correct tag I can actually um, you know stop checking any of the others. So I don't want to continue. I don't want to break either because if I break out of this loop what will happen is it will just execute 
the next line here, which is on puzzle solved. What I want to do is actually to leave the function altogether and not do anything more. And that's why I've called the return function instead. So return will immediately exit from uh, the whole of this function and will continue the execution of code from whatever the, the calling function was. So if we're going to loop over all the readers, if any of the readers differs from their intended uh, correct ID, as soon as that happens we're going to just stop stop checking, stop this function completely. Okay. However, if we get all the way through this loop and that hasn't happened, that means that we've been able to loop over every reader and they are exactly the same as our correct ID. Well, in that case, we can call on puzzle solved. And this is the final uh, function in the code. So this is the one that actually gets called when everything is correct. So this is where you'd include um, you know anything that you want to to happen on successful completion of the puzzle basically and what are we going to do well we're going to activate our relay as I mentioned previously we do that by writing a low signal onto the relay pin um, but you know you can do whatever you want you can display a message on a screen perhaps you could uh, send an MQTT message uh, to a game server software saying that the puzzle had been completed. Um, you know, this this is the section where you would add that kind of detail in. Um, and then also we now need to get that latched state set up where um, effectively for now we're going to freeze out the main body of the the puzzle controller. We don't want to carry on processing the inputs. The only thing we want to do from now on is listen to see whether that reset card gets detected. And that's what uh, we're going to do in this section here. So we'll uh, declare a boolean variable which we'll call reset detected and we'll call that false to start with because we'll assume that we haven't yet detected a reset. And then we've got a while function here. So this section here is going to keep on getting executed over and over for as long as a reset has not been detected because we've got an exclamation mark at the beginning so that negates the function um, and we know that at the moment a reset has not been detected so we're going to just loop over and over this section here and while it's looping what are we going to do well uh, this really is kind of a, a cut down version of the detection routine that we were using in the main program loop earlier we're going to loop over all the readers. We're going to declare a new variable called this UID again, just as we did before. Again, we're going to call get inventory on whichever of the readers we're currently looking at in the loop. We're going to use it to populate this UID and we'll get the code to see if we were successful in doing that. So this is exactly the same as the, the main approach we were using to read the cards before, except uh, this time round we'll write a single line here that says if we were able to read a tag successfully and also if the ID of the tag that we were able to read uh, was exactly the same as the reset ID that we programmed at the top of the code then reset detected is now true and as soon as reset is detected as true this loop here is no longer uh, going to continue because this only continues while reset detected is false. So that means that we then write reset on the screen on the serial monitor. We'll reset the relay pin to high again and now execution can carry on. So we come out of the on puzzle solved function here and we return back to our main program loop where we were listening uh, for the the correct objects again, so that's how we've created a, a sort of a a function here, which we just loop round and round while it's been in this latch state, and then as soon as the condition is broken, uh, we return back to our main program loop, and that's it. So there you have my object placement escape room puzzle using RFID sensors, all updated for 2020. So I'm now using vicinity sensors rather than proximity sensors. That means that there's a lot more tolerance about where players actually position the item that needs to be detected. And ultimately that leads to a better player experience for them. 
I'm using a faster, more capable processor, the ESP32, which is easier to interface with any sort of game control system you might be running. So you can send MQTT messages when the puzzle is solved. You can interface it with Node-RED or with any other software you might be running. I'm using uh, network cabling as a convenient way to just carry those data signals from the ESP to the sensors. And although I'm dressing this up in a Christmas theme, obviously you can use this in many, many different escape rooms. You can have an Egyptian themed room where you have to position um, canopic jars in a particular order and things like that. You can use it in space. You can use it in uh, Indiana Jones rooms, as many rooms as you want. It's very, very versatile and very common puzzle. So I hope you have enjoyed watching that as always. I will upload the code samples, the wiring diagrams, the list for where I purchase these parts from and things like that. I will put those over on my Patreon page. Uh, I'm only able to make these tutorials with the very generous support of my patrons who are all amazing. So I want to thank them all very much. If you do want to head over there, you can find uh, all of the resources that go with my previous tutorials as well. I will continue to put these videos on YouTube anyway, so if you do not want to or if you are unable to contribute, that's absolutely fine. Don't worry, I will carry on putting them here anyway. I really enjoy making them. And other than that, all that remains for me to say is that I wish you a very Merry Christmas and a happy and peaceful New Year, and I look forward to seeing you again in 2021. Okay, cheers. Bye.